now to our time of prayer. Each time we gather as community, we bring forth the names of those in our midst who are in need of our prayers. Our prayers for healing, our prayers for comfort, our prayers for hope. This day we remember Dottie Allen, Gretchen Ebersole, Tom Forney, Darlene Gilliam, Donna Hagerty, David Macy, Bill Morris, the Oliver family, Ephraim Rivera, and Day Day Topway. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Here we are, Lord. It is us, Lord. Again, we have heard you calling us in the night. We have heard you calling us to gather once again in community where we hear your voice, where we seek your spirit, and where we come together as one in you. O oh God of snow and rain, we call on you for nurture of our souls, for nurture of our earth, for nurture of our world. We know that you have heard your people crying in the night. People all across this community, <coughs> those in the cool night last night without shelter, those this morning who were seeking bread to eat, and those across our world who slept through a night where they had heard guns ring out or missiles fire. We know, O oh God, that you have heard your people calling. O oh God of sea and sky, who gave us this expansive creation as a reminder of the wideness and breadth of your grace. Help us ever know that you are with us even in the midst of the world's deep sorrow. God of wind and flame, we acknowledge this day that you are an attention-getting God, that when we slip away into the depths of our minds, you awaken us to see once again what is in front of us what is calling us, who is needing us. And so here we are, Lord. We have heard you calling. And we hear you calling this day. May our answer ever be, we will go where you lead us. And we will always hold your people, those among us and those far from us, in your heart. This we pray. Amen.
God, we present these offerings that they may be used to extend your liberating reign. With them, we offer our varied ministries in the days ahead, that each of us may be part of your answer to the cries of the world. Amen.
today from the book of Joshua recounts the events of the history of Israel. In a single chapter, we are given a timeline of all sorts of all the major events from some of the stories of Genesis and Exodus. They all seem to be the critical events that shaped the history of Israel, many of which were close calls, no doubt. The escape from beyond the Red Sea, the possession of the land east of Jordan and the destruction of the Amorites, the Battle of Jericho. There is also, though, the reiteration of the promise and fulfillment of many descendants. Joshua had assembled all those elders and judges and officials of the tribes of Israel. As they gather, Joshua starts out with the words, long ago, long ago. And he reminds them of their heritage. The desire to look back is always motivated by many and various things. Sometimes we tell a story for its entertainment value. Particularly if we narrowly escaped danger and can embellish the plot a little bit. But at other times we look back as a way of defining who we are, where we have been, and how the events of our lives have shaped us. At some time in your life or career, you may have been a part of a group or workshop where you were invited to create your own personal timeline, a place where you draw the line across the page and mark out those critical events in your life, times of both crisis and celebration that are characterized by change and transition, sometimes by pain and suffering, but which are often the food for times of personal growth in our lives. These are often what I would call God's attention-getting times. We seem then more alert and more receptive to what God would have us to know and learn about life and faith. Times like graduation, or the acceptance of a new job, welcoming a new baby or grandbaby, enduring a serious illness, a move across country, a crisis or an accident. These things are our mile markers. I think it is true that many of these events involve a choice. We can choose life and faith and make our way down a path of darkness. We can choose God and we can give ourselves over to the worship of other things, like material things, or money, or prosperity, or self-grandeur. Much of the recounting of the history of Israelites, much of the history of these events of the Israelites involve where they made a choice to follow God or to go some other wandering direction. In this very chapter, they are given the choice again, reminding us once more that our faith is an ongoing process and we must affirm and reaffirm our faith in God and our desire to follow God. Joshua even heckles them a bit with a sense of judgment saying, no, you can't serve the Lord. The Lord, a jealous God, will not forgive you your rebellion. If you turn your back on God, God will bring disaster on you and make an end of you. Now that's not exactly the most inspiring of messages. This discouragement.
description of God as a vengeful God who brings wrath actively down upon us when we push our faith to the background is a difficult passage to comprehend. One way to understand this is that in the midst of challenging and critical times, in the midst of the turning points in our life journeys, or church journeys, I might add, particularly those which feel threatening, we tend to vacillate heavy from one theological extreme to the other. Giving God all the responsibility and the credit for an event or giving God none of it. Some time back, I read an article written by a physician in the newsletter of his state hospital association. In it, he was reflecting on the meaning of faith for his patients during times of critical illness. He had just su successfully completed a rather complex surgery on one of his patients, and some weeks later saw the patient in his office for a follow-up visit. They exchanged words of greeting and words of celebration about how well the patient had done. The patient replied exuberantly, yes, the Lord really pulled me through. The physician, who was very much a man of faith himself, and not at all skeptical about the presence of God's Spirit, went away pondering how God always got all the credit for those events. <laughs> So there's a tinge of this phenomenon in Joshua as he says to the Israelites, you live in cities which you did not build and eat from vineyards which you did not plant. I expect the Israelites who labored hard had difficulty understanding what this meant. In times of crisis, whether it's when we are actually going through it or when we're retelling it, People at times either forget God or place all the responsibility in God's hands. In the best of times, I think it's a partnership. A partnership where we try hard relying on God's spirit. We go to the doctor's appointments and follow our medication regimes while praying for God's healing spirit. We study hard to make the grades while hoping that God will lead us to a fulfilling career. My uncle, a farmer all of his life, used to plant the crops, till the ground, amend the soil, sow the seeds, and thank God when the crops were fruitful. It's a partnership. The wonderful thing about this partnership is that we don't always have to take the initiative. Sometimes we can. We can go out in full search of God, into silence, into the woods with prayer book in hand. We can walk into worship with anticipation. Some even take journeys across the ocean to walk the labyrinths of the great cathedrals. We can go searching, but God always comes looking for us, too. Remember all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden. After missing them because they were hiding, God went out walking into the garden looking for them, saying, Where are you? Why are you hiding? It's one of the first things we learn about the relationship of God with God's people. And God is still walking in the garden. God deeply wants to be in relationship with us. 
Joshua tells the story of the conquest, allotment, and occupation of the promised land. It's part two. It's the sequel to the first five books of the Bible, which tell of the journey to get to the promised land. Remember, they're journeying to the land of milk and honey. The book of Joshua is also a story about war, a holy war, and it recounts bloodshed at the command, it seems, of God. A story we find difficult to murder. It's what Joshua seems to feel. Without its wars of conquest, Israel could scarcely have entered its glorious destiny. And then we have to struggle with what destiny justifies war. This church has been through some trials, and it has experienced times of glorious destiny. Arlington has just been through a difficult season of transition and change. I know that you look around sometimes and don't see as many people as you once did. I know that you look around and you don't see the youth and the children from days gone by. Does God send us challenging times where we feel worry or even guilt in order to then bring us to some glorious destiny? I don't think so. But must we now ask what is there for me to learn about God and faith and self through these events? I absolutely do think so. The great Merlin said to King Arthur and the once and future king, there is but one thing and that is for us to learn. The history of the people of God, the history of the church, is not written for the sake of history alone, but to illustrate the ways of God with the people of God. And through our history, we learn. When through our history we do not learn, we repeat our mistakes, and then with any amount of grace, we may learn the second time around. God is there, gracious all the while, with us always. There's a fascinating twist to the storytelling in Joshua that I didn't read today, but it follows today's passage, and I think it is so fascinating. All this time, the people of Israel had been carrying around the bones of Joseph, one of their ancestors. Joseph had been a beloved leader of theirs who had died earlier, and they were still carrying his bones with them, apparently because he had wanted to be buried in a certain place. It was a sign of honor. In a way, it was also a sign of carrying around what they had loved about Joseph. Then there came a time to let him go. This didn't mean they gave up their good memories about him, but that they were no longer encumbered by what they were carrying. This is strangely not unlike what the transition time between ministers is like. You have memories of former pastors in your church. You may have heard stories of the founding pastor or stories about the early formative years of this church's early history. And you have memories of Bruce who led this church with great vision of living the gospel in the way that Jesus taught. Each person who has served here has their gifts and their flaws. And with each, there is also a time to let go of our expectations to restore something in the way that it was. 
This doesn't mean letting go of memories and celebrations of all that was good in your past. But a letting go of any hold that the past has on you. Or vice versa. Any hold that you have on the past. So that you can be who you are called to be for your future. Each time, this kind of letting go is central to being able to fully welcome others into your midst. While we are reminded of the covenant of Israel, we have some choosing of our own going on. Remember that Joshua said to them, Choose this day who you will serve. And the people of Israel emphatically said, We will serve and obey God. On a personal level, we may choose to seek God more fully. We may choose to discern the will of God in our lives. We may choose to take that wide path of giving and loving not the narrow path of holding on to. There is a beautiful 19th century hymn with these poetic words. There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice, which is more than liberty. There's no place where earthly sorrows are more felt than in God's heaven. There's no place where earthly failings have such kindly judgment given. For the love of God is broader than the measures of our mind. God has love like an ocean deep and broad. May we ever know that the height and depth and width of God's love is with us, is with us. Our invitation is choose this day. May our commitment ever be, as for we and our house, we will serve the Lord together as one. Thank God for the depth of God's love in your history. Choose for your future the wide, wide grace of God. Thanks be to God.
served churches in California as an associate minister and a professional interim. She entered the ordained ministry after years of service as a lay member of UCC churches. She holds degrees from National University and from the School of Theology in Claremont, California. She is a gardener, a bird lover, and a fan of the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> that should make for some interesting conversations. She is married to Bill Peterson, who is also a UCC minister. Bill has some health concerns and is not able to be with us this morning, but he is also coming to us by way of Facebook to also join in membership at Arlington this morning. Let me tell you a few things about him. Bill Peterson is an ordained minister, also standing in the UCC. He has served churches in Illinois and California as a pastor, a pastoral counselor, and a professional interim also. His degrees are from Chicago Theological <coughs> Seminary, the University of Chicago, and Nova Southeastern University. Bill started out as an engineer with the Boeing Company in Seattle. In his church work with young people during the Vietnam tragedy, led him then to change professions. He enjoys writing poetry and, guess what, cheering on the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> and, of course, he is married to Gail. Together, Gail and Bill share four adult children and two grandchildren. So they have been with us over Facebook for a little bit of time since moving from California and she's interested in transferring her standing to the Florida Conference and thus wants to become a member of this church. So I invite you, in the insert in your program, there is a reception uh, litany for new members. So I invite you to join me in that in the sections that are printed in bold. Friends in Christ, we are all received into the church and called to ministry through the sacrament of baptism. Anyone who has been led to share in our vision and ministry is welcome to join us. The ones who join us today are here to be nurtured in Christ and to serve Christ using the gifts that the Holy Spirit bestows. Friends, Gail and Bill, you have stepped forward to affirm your desire to partner with Arlington Congregational United Church of Christ in its mission and ministry. We ask you to join with us in proclaiming the mission of this church. Join me. Arlington Congregational Church, a united church of Christ, is a community of faith devoted to spiritual growth through worship of God and committed to ministries of love and compassion inspired by Jesus Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Gail and Bill by way of Facebook, do you covenant according to the grace given to you to share in the ministry of Jesus Christ through this church, upholding its mission and vision, and joining with other Christians here and worldwide, work for love and justice as you fulfill your calling to be his disciple. I do with God's help. Let us welcome and affirm our sister and brother in Christ as we covenant to be with them in Christ's church. We welcome you with joy in the work of Jesus Christ. We covenant with you to share our friendship, prayers, hopes, and labors in his name. May the Holy Spirit lead us to grow and mature as we bear fruit for his glory as members of the Holy Congregational Church. Let us pray. Our God, we celebrate this day. 
gifts of your people are spread across our land, across our community and our world. We celebrate this day that Gail and Bill have found their way to us, and we look forward through the gifts of your spirit to the ways that they will enrich their own lives through their life with us, and that we may enrich our church journey through our relationships with them. Bless them with your grace and strength, and continue to bless this congregation as we welcome others among us. For it is in your holy name that we pray. Amen. And I invite Brad, who is our moderator, to just bring a word of welcome on behalf of the church. Well, Gail and Bill, I really appreciate you joining the church. I look forward to your service to our church. I'm going to ask you for your service. So get ready. Get ready. And I do welcome, and I present you to our congregation, and Gail and Bill as new members. And I have a couple of gifts for you, which I am going to be, you can bear the burden of taking it to Bill. Do I have to share with him? No. <laughs> Two handles, I hope you can get this one over here as well. That's probably been helpful. And thank you. And thank you. Well, thank you. And I want to say, you are a very welcoming community. <laughs> Everyone has smiles, and you didn't know me and said hello, and I just appreciate how my relationship with you has started. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, Brett. Good morning. Good morning. I'm taking this opportunity to give an update as to our pastoral uh, new uh, minister coming, Michael, uh, Reverend Dr. Michael Piazza. Lots of adjectives there. Um, I, you know, last time we spoke, we voted and, and probably have not had an update since then. So I feel like it's an important day to, to bring you up to speed. The eight person uh, committee, search committee, and interviewed several excellent candidates. I think we've talked about that. Um, I think Mary Moore's message today was spot on to where we are, and I really appreciate the timing of that. We also analyzed as a committee what our church's needs were, and as a whole and un unanimous agreement of our that we need to grow our church. That's really what it came down to that was needed as our number one goal. Michael was called to be our minister at this church because of his knowledge, his experience, and the energy that he brings to his position. I will say that Michael is already very much involved with our church and our congregation. Um, he is ready to start the next chapter of this church on November 27th. He moved his date of starting from December to November 27th, and that's a, re a reason is because that's the first Sunday of Advent, and he wants to start there. So he's kind of accelerated his move. He is purchasing a home uh, in Springfield, and uh, he is going to be arriving in the next week or so. Um, he's held a two-hour staff meeting with uh, this past week with Grace, Sally, and, and uh, Barbara, uh, and reviewed what interaction and thoughts and working with them with their ideas on how to make the transition really work. He's been in contact with the worship committee and has met with them this past Monday uh, for a, a quite a long meeting and they are uh, scheduling and creating the advent calendar for the next several months. Um, the the uh, worship committee has decided to review the revise the bulletin which will include printed music within the bulletin. Reverend Michael has uh, chosen to start November 27th. He understands that services are not just week by week. 
that they actually are seasoned or a quarter, several months at a time in planning to make it a cohesive message over a period of time. So he has been active in trying to plan that calendar with the worship committee. I will take this moment that if anyone is interested in participating on the committee levels, this is your moment. Gail, you can sign up today. <laughs> um, you know, this is your church and the committees are going to be making the, co the, the decisions of our refreshed uh, directions. And if you want to be a part of the decisions or you want to hear what's going on, pick a committee and come sit in. If you like, like it, stay. If you don't, move on. But don't sit silent. <coughs> we're currently updating our website. Actually, we're replacing our website. And this is an amazing statement of the type of man that is coming to be our minister. He is paying for the website to be created. It will be um, one that will give us better communication to our community, to our congregation, and to the uh, ministries that we serve. It will allow our staff and our committees to communicate to you easier. He feels so passionate about uh, updating this website. As I said, he owns, and you may know this, but I'll refresh, he owns a company that is a consultant company for churches. And that consultant company is the one that is developing the website. And he was here eight years ago as a consultant, and that's how he knows us and we know him. That's where it all started. Reverend Michael has also purchased two TV monitors for our use in our service with his own money again, because he feels it's so important. So we are working on the transition of having these monitors available to replace and brighten and intensify this screen that we have now. It'll be placed over here. And they'll also be able to go down to Fellowship Hall for other uh, presentations. And so there'll be a very nice uh, piece of multimedia, I'll call it. Um, these monitors will also be closed caption. All that's said and all that's done will be printed on closed caption. So it will help our hearing impaired and replace with this experiment that we have going on here. Um, I have requested Reverend Michael to give us ideas from his knowledge, from large to small, and techniques and thoughts of, you know, where, what's our next moves. He has provided some, and those have been funneled and will be funneled through the committees so that the committee can ponder them, analyze them, see if they're what should be done or what adjustments can be done. And at the right time, they'll be instigated, instituted correctly with all your opinions. If you have any additional questions of what is in going on, I can tell you that it is really exciting how much energy is coming and will arrive November 27th. Um, and if you have any additional questions, anything particular, I'm going to be here after church today. I'll answer any and all questions as detailed as I can. Thank you for your time.
This is a life of choice for you. God is with us always with that invitation. Amen. Thank you.